What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Two Dimes and a Token. I'm your host, Brooke Nasty. In this episode, I had to go on another solo mission, unfortunately, but we met with a great friend of our podcast, uh, has has uh, b- been a big influencer of our podcast for a long time. Um, his, his name is Mr. Lauren. He is actually the founder and creator of LRD, Leave Religion Defenseless Podcast, and he's also got a bunch of social media pages. He's got a YouTube page. He's got a podcast that he posts on Spotify, Apple, every anywhere that you look, you can find it. But this podcast was so unique to us. So his version and the way that he rolled out his platform was to shine the light on some of the uh, global religious issues, but also understanding that um, higher level church uh, functions and the way that they do things can be a little askewed from time to time. So we had a big educational sit down about what his podcast was about. Um, we also He also was able to teach me about a lot of the religious factors as far as different denominations, different way that people carry themselves, different parts of the world that have different influences, all kinds of stuff. Um, but as I said, it was very, very unique to where he shines a light onto some of the things that a lot of the church organization loves to make sure no one sees. And he tells quite a few stories about his experiences growing up. Um, he also tells experiences about himself as he does work in the church world. So he's got a very unique system going on. And like I said, we found him super interesting. We thought the idea would be really, really cool to kind of run over. So anybody that anybody that's had any affiliation as far as a passion about church or anything like that, I think it's a great listen. I think it's extremely educational as well. So um, besides that, before you guys, before we get into the episode, when you guys have a chance, make sure you go in, press the subscribe button. Make sure you guys leave the comment at the end. We are still doing our spice of the week. So you want to make sure you go down there in the comment section of our YouTube page underneath the episode, write down your spice of the week so that we can engage with you and we can comment with you. Or if you want to just go onto any one of our social media platforms, let us know your spice of the week. Also be sure to check out our merch store. We have some new shot glasses and everything going up in there. And we've gotten shirts down to $12 a shirt, so make sure you go check us out. And once again, make sure you hit that subscribe button, help us out. We love bringing you some awesome content. We got some awesome plans for the future. So let's keep it going. And without further ado, let us check out Mr. Lauren with LRD. Now we're starting. Here we go. Now we're rolling. What is our drink of the pod? All right. So I requested mezcal because I'm yeah. a huge mezcal guy. And for yes. those, if you don't know what mezcal is, it's a smoky tequila. Yeah. Uh, you know, you just put it on a barbecue grill for like 12 hours and just it's it's tequila <laughs> that's got some smoke to it. Um, but yeah, I requested mezcal and you got the Casamigos, which I think was the NBA's official tequila last season. Yeah. I don't know if it'll be this season. Uh, and then I just got kind of weird with it, bro. We yeah. We some, uh, some jalapeno in there. Yeah. A little bit of club soda, uh, some mango juice, and we just went for it. So, you know, is it, is I, don't, that, um, I don't have a name that's not super maybe. racist. So, I don't know. <laughs> I think, like, let's just call it a burnt poncho for now. A burnt poncho. Yeah, why not? I dig it. Mm-hmm. Dude, that uh, the jalapeno is starting to get in there. It's going to creep up on you. Yeah, I like that. That's good. I like the yep. spice in there, dude. Yep. So let us dive all the way in here, brother. I've been super stoked. I know when I first asked you, it was kind of like, I don't know. We'll see how this goes. Yeah. But um, wanted to bring you on, dude, obviously. So you have a podcast and a channel and a platform that you have titled Leave Religion Defenseless. Yeah. Right? Um, give us some insight. What is this platform that you've created? Oh man. Okay. So, uh, I've been working in churches since I was like 15, 16. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been a worship leader. I've pastored an entire church before. I've been a college pastor, almost every position you could be in a church. Yeah. And, uh, I would say for the majority of my experiences, it sucked like (laughs) real bad. (laughs) Like that's the dirty secret we're not supposed to say. Right? Yeah. And I feel like if you ask any pastor who's worth his salt or anybody who's been in church ministry, if they're being honest with you and have a couple of these, yeah. uh, they're going to tell you it sucks and they'll give you a laundry list of reasons. Um, 
We just, uh, my wife and I, been married eight years now. Uh, we've been in big churches, we've been in small churches, mm-hmm. and there's just this common thread that runs through them uh, where people kind of go through the uh, the cycle of they can come into a church, oh, it's welcome, it's lobby, it's hey, we're here, we're family. But then the moment these people, not even just people like in the church ministry, but just like regular folks coming into church, the moment they do something the church doesn't like, or they have a lifestyle that they might disagree with, or any myriad of things, uh, people get put through the ringer and they get spit out the other side. Yeah, And um, it really just starts jacking with people's heads, with people's faith. I mean, imagine... Uh, someone like me who grew up in church, uh, you know, since they were like two or probably younger. Yeah. And then that's been their whole life, their whole social ecosystem. And then now they're 18, 19, 20, they have some questions or maybe they're doing things differently than they were raised to do. And all of a sudden this community that's been surrounding them for 18 years just decides they want nothing with them any- to do with them anymore. Yeah. Uh, and they just chews them up and spits them out. <clears throat> uh, it's super common. Uh, okay. Statistically, especially our generation, like the millennial generation, uh, it is the fastest leaving generation of church in America in all history. Uh, yeah. We are just bouncing. And then the Gen Z generation coming after us is the most unchurched generation in all of American history. So Leave Religion Defenseless was uh, an effort to talk to those people, to create a space where if you've gone through the ringer, uh, maybe you're out of church now and you don't know how you feel about your faith. Maybe you just want to hear somebody vent about church and everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, Or maybe you still do have your faith, but you don't feel like you belong in church anymore or they don't want you or you just can't step foot in there for whatever reason. Leave Religion Defenseless was built as a platform to just talk to those people, to give those people a sense of belonging, a sense of like, hey, somebody else is going through things. Yeah. Uh, and what's so cool about our channel is like, yeah, I make content and we have topics and we do the podcast and all that stuff. But what's really cool is watching people talk through the comment threads to each other. And like, really? Bro, I can't believe I, my, I had a similar situation that happened to me just like that. Yeah. So that I think that's one of the coolest things is watching the community that got built around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then watching some Christians who still maybe haven't come to terms with the idea that church sucks sometimes <laughs> squirm when they see some of these videos, yeah. you know, um, I'm by no means like a theologian, uh, but I've done my research and I know a thing or two about a thing or two. Yeah. Uh, and it's fun when you get to put the ball back in their court and say, well, what about this? And yeah. then watching people who will fearlessly defend some really outdated dogmatic practices be like, I don't know what to do with that. And most of the time, the hyper Christians that are upset at what we do, it's because they don't have a response. They're just like, oh, it, uh, oh, it's well, you must be wrong because I don't have an answer. For yeah. that, so. <laughs> so. That's a great way to answer things. OK, so that's an intense idea, man. And I get where you're coming from, especially from a person. I, I didn't grow up in church um, and I'm extremely uneducated about it as as I've gotten involved in our family and things sure. like that. Like I've learned and picked up things as we've gone. But um When did you start having this idea and when did it start to flourish and when did you start making your platform? If I'm being honest, bro, probably ever since I was like 12, 13, 14, I knew there was always a little BS involved in the church world. I'm not saying like faith or believing in God or Jesus is the BS. I mean, all the stuff that just happens in the systematic structure of church. And just to clarify, I'm mostly talking about like the evangelical world in America. I don't know what's happening outside of the States as far as like what other countries and and how they practice their Christianity. Can you uh, elaborate evangelical? Evangelical. Yeah. So it is kind of an umbrella term. Um, A lot of people would probably have a hard time pegging it down. I would say anything that identifies as like Pentecostal, anything that would identify as charismatic, uh, most Baptists, Southern Baptists are going to be in that most, not all, but most non-denominational churches you run into. Um, Most churches that have uh, a light show during worship are probably going to fit under that category. (laughs) I'm not throwing shade. I'm just saying like, that's what you're walking into. Like that's probably under the evangelical umbrella, as opposed to something that looks a lot more traditional, like um, say the Methodist church or the uh, Lutherans or the Presbyterians. If you walk in and there's pews and it feels a little stuffy and old school, it's probably not evangelical. So when I hear that, I think like Catholic. Yeah. So think of like... So, you know, I think it was in the 1500s, 
uh, everybody was Catholic and yeah. then the Protestant Reformation happened and then there was the Protestants and the Catholics. So I would say the evangelicals are the farthest progressed Protestants and yeah. the people like the Presbyterians and the Methodists, those are the ones that hung on to a lot of the uh, practices that the Catholics had, but not okay. all the beliefs. Okay. So they're going to feel a little bit more old school, which interestingly enough, the more conservative, like the more pewy a church is, the more <laughs> old school it is, most of the time, they're way more socially liberal. They're like, really? they're cool with uh, like gay families and transgender and they're very big on social rights and, uh, you know, like all social justice and all that stuff. Yeah. And it's the evangelicals who have the light shows and the, yeah, let's meet in the lobby and throw donuts at each other. <laughs> but we hate the gays. <laughs> it's like, they, wow. that's where they've drawn the line. <laughs> so Line is in the sand. <laughs> and it's not just with that. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, yeah. I hate to, to, and I definitely don't want to like talk about politics, but like most of the, if not all of the evangelical world is hyper conservative. They're, okay. they're mostly going to vote Republican. And so that political slant also informs how they run their churches and what types of people they associate with or don't associate with. Okay. So, I got you. Um, so, they're they're kind of two in one. They're, they're combined at this point. I got you. We interrupt this podcast to bring you Sunterra Solar Solutions, a leading edge solar company committed to making sure they provide a phenomenal experience to its customers. Going solar was one of the best decisions that I ever made. Not only did they provide me a no hassle experience, it didn't feel like a sales experience. It felt like an amazing person to person having a conversation on whether solar was gonna be right for me. I was fortunate enough to not only lower my monthly energy cost, but they gave me an option to be able to create a stabilized monthly bill that I could prepare around. I qualified for a new customer incentive that put cash in my hand after installation as well as I qualified for a tax credit at the end of that same year after I had it installed. All in all, not only was it the best decision I ever made, I lowered my monthly energy costs, I stabilized my bill, I put a ton of cash in hand, it felt like I got paid to go solar. And my most favorite part that I haven't even mentioned, it eliminated my exposure to future increasing rates from the utility companies. So if you think going solar is the right thing for you, by all means, hit us up in our DMs. We can connect you with a sales associate today. And now back to the episode. Okay, so now that I've interrupted, go ahead and continue when you started. And then you said you were what, like 12? Well, I would say 12 or 13 is when you start, like, I think most people, like, you know, uh, 12 or 13, your teacher says something stupid in school and you're like, wait, you're kind of an idiot. Like, <laughs> you know I'm like, there's that, like, I feel like once you hit a teenager, there's, there's the avenue for skepticism yeah. in, in really anything, yeah. whether it's your teachers, your parents, your, your religious systems. So I think probably around 12 or 13 is when I was like, hold on. I've been in this community of believers. I'm in youth group. Uh, my grandparents were elders at the church and one of the largest churches in America at one point. Um, and you just start seeing behind the curtain. Yeah. You start seeing behind the scenes. I'm friends with the pastors, the head pastors, uh, grandkids. And at the time, the church is like five, six, eight thousand 8,000 people deep. Yeah. So getting to spend time at their house, going to pool parties and barbecues. You get to see how the sausage is made a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you also get to see when uh, staff gets fired at the churches and the re multiple reasons that someone would get fired at churches, embezzling money, uh, extramarital affairs. You start seeing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And at 12, 13, you don't really know how to process it, but you do know that they're teaching you in youth group like, hey, don't have sexual thoughts. But then the five, the pastor's, you know, accountant just got married for sleeping with like, you know, a secretary. Yeah. And it's like, hold on. There's <laughs> something's not connected. So it's like, here. do as I say, not as I do. Right. But feeling. then the church goes to great lengths. Most churches to bury that kind of stuff, keep yeah. it hidden, get rid of those people, pay them off. I've been paid off a couple of times by churches, <laughs> oh, not for shit. like extramarital affairs or anything. Damn. <laughs> uh, but the church has a lot of resources. Uh, most of them have quite a bit of money at hand and they also have special insurances they can buy if they, I'll just kind of come out and say it there. There are certain insurances churches can buy, say if uh, a youth pastor is caught molesting or sexually harassing one of the youth kids. Yeah. Churches can carry insurance to cover them in case something like that happens in what? their church. <laughs> yeah. That's wild, bro. Right. Yeah. There's all kinds of stuff like people don't know about. Um, so I think, 
12, 13, 14, 15. As I got older, I started seeing how the sausage was made more. Um, and once again, I don't know that this ever had an impact on my faith, my belief in Jesus or God, but it definitely shook my faith in church yeah. and like the system uh, that I was a part of. Yeah. And then I got older and played some music and started touring and getting to travel the country, going to churches, seeing... I think part of us is always like when bad things happen, it's probably just here, right? Like it's yeah. probably just my church or it's just my city. I got to get out in the world a little bit and yeah. I got to see that like the story is the same almost everywhere. Uh, my wife grew up in Michigan, you know, 2000 some miles away from where we are now. And it's crazy. The story she'll tell from her growing up in a similar, not the same denomination, but similar. Yeah. Uh, and how eerily close the stories are. Really? Yeah. Uh, one of her friends that she grew up with, uh, youth pastor, I, I don't think they would associate his friends now. He literally went to prison last year for uh, molesting multiple boys. And he was the youth wow. pastor. Pastor's son, by the way. Really? So I'm not going to call it the church or his name or yeah, anything like yeah. that. But it happens. And it happens all the time. And it's not just that. There's multiple abuses that happen in the church. Yeah. That church to this day still claims he's innocent, even though they had text messages. The yeah. court had text messages. Like, they caught him. Like, there's no doubt. Like, yeah. he was found guilty on all counts in a court of law. <laughs> that church still maintains he's innocent. They still maintain uh, that they had no knowledge of what was happening the whole time. That, yeah. So they're innocent. And it's actually a big conspiracy to remove the pastors from the church. Really? Yeah. That's So to me, what it what it's, it's kind of like you're laying it out. It's it's almost contradicting. And again, this is just a, this is a, a completely uneducated mind off of the last five minutes. Sure, listening, sure. Right. It sounds like you have some, some churches that build pastors up that are almost like the next person that touches, you know, the idea of God. Right. Right. And they can do no wrong. But, what you're saying basically is coming across like, hey, we live we live in the world with humans. Like sure. we're not we're not perfect. Right. Right. Don't portray that image. Well, and I think the big difference that I'm always trying to make is like, dude, I'll be the first one to raise my hand. My kids, my wife will be the next ones in line. I am not perfect. Yeah. Far from it. I make so many mistakes. I've made a ton of mistakes in my life. Yeah. I've been uh, I feel like I'm a pretty good dude now. But there's been times in my life where I wasn't a good dude and yeah. I'll totally own up to those times. And there's times where that kicked me in the butt and I got what I had coming. And then there's other times where I got away with it. Yeah. Like we all do, right? Like we're all human. Yeah. What I'm not trying to do is say like, oh, we need to crucify every single pastor or church leader who makes mistakes. That's not what I'm trying to say. I think we have to have grace, whether you're a pastor, whether you're homeless, whether you're making a podcast. I think we all have to have grace for each other to make mistakes. We're all human. Yeah. And I think we need to have a little wiggle room, like not praise people when they make mistakes, but be like, bro, I get it. Like that sucks. What you did sucked, yeah. but I'm still with you. But yeah. like, let's try to clean this up, not do that yeah. again. <laughs> I figure what you're laying down. Uh, but that's like, that's, that's, that should be good human nature, right? Where we mm -hmm. leave a little wiggle room. So what I'm not trying to do is crucify every leader, pastor uh, who makes mistakes. What I am trying to completely obliterate is systems that exist to protect those people. That's when you. it gets dangerous. Yeah. Um, because if you can throw enough money at a problem, if you can throw enough shame at a group of people saying, hey, hold on, this guy did something wrong. And then the church comes back and says, if you say anything, you're out. We yeah. You won't be a part of our community more. Bro, this happens every single day. I swear to you, statistically, this kind of stuff happens every single day in churches in America. And, and it's funny because the idea, like I said, connecting dots here, the idea is these people are taking in what is being taught in that community. Sure. And then when they're going to act on the things that they're taught, when somebody in that community makes a mistake, if it's someone significant, sure. now all of a sudden the community that these, these people could have known their entire lives right. are like, do it and you're gone. Right. And that's like, yeah, that would be a massive shell shock. That would be insane. I don't yeah. know how I would handle something like that. Most people walk and they never come back. Statistically speaking. Yeah. Most people bounce, especially in our generation. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you go to our parents' generation and our grandparents' generation. Um, it, I don't want to say it was uncool. It was almost unheard of to question your pastor. Unless there was just something heinous out in the open going on. Yeah. Um, so you didn't do it. And in fact, 
I've had this line used against me. I know multiple people have. If you attack your pastor, it's like attacking God. Wow. So it almost gives your pastor or any church leader in that position free reign to do whatever they want to a certain extent. Cause obviously like jail and things yeah. exist, but yeah. <laughs> um, you know, just think courts exist. <laughs> but I mean, let's, let's say something not illegal. What if your pastor is just a huge jerk to all of his staff, just belittles his, his church assistants, yeah. treats everyone like garbage. That's not illegal, but the church could go to great lengths to cover that up because he gives a bomb three point sermon and he knows how to make you cry during an altar call. Yeah. And that brings in numbers of people and that brings in revenue. Lots of churches make lots of money. It's just like the idea of entertainment. You could have an actor that is off the charts on screen is absolutely incredible, but could be the most difficult person in the world to work with. Look, bro, I didn't want to say Christian Bale and Tom Cruise. You said it, not me. <laughs> Listen. That's awesome. We should probably blank that part out. I, I want to wake up next week and like Christian Bale's like at me at Twitter. Like, what the heck, bro? You want to go? <laughs> no. That, dude. <laughs> Have you seen those though? The like when I he freaked have. out on set? Like, I have, yes, absolutely. Like maybe and he was just having a bad day. I don't, I don't you know. never know, bro. See how it goes. But no, man, like that's the whole thing. Like there's, there's, it's almost like when our uh, financial system and our government gets in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you remember the whole like, what was it, Freddie Mae, uh, the, the financial collapse. Yeah. Where we yeah. had to bail out some of those banks, the US government did. Oh, yeah. It was the, the phrase used commonly was too big to fail. Yeah. Those banks had so much people's money, it would topple our economy or take a big dent out of it. Uh, so what the government did is it says, okay, we're going to pump money into this because if it fails, it's going to ruin everything. Think of a lot of the church systems in the same way. Yeah. If all of this stuff comes to light, um, this church could crumble. It could collapse. And you're not only talking about a building, you're talking about how many people are employed at that church, from the head pastor to the janitorial staff, uh, how much money is getting pumped into that church. Um, you know, I work for a church right now. I won't say who it is or where it is. Yeah. Uh, their estimated giving every year is about $2 million. And they're not a huge church. Yeah. So there's money. Yeah. There's jobs. There's families. There's all this stuff involved. So you can see how any system may go to great lengths to protect someone who's even dead wrong because they don't want the system collapse. And therein lies the problem. When the yeah. system allows bad things to happen to good people because of the sake of the system, that's yeah. when you get into big trouble and people get hurt. And like you said, so you're still you're still working in that environment. Right. Somehow. Some <laughs> now, I will say, um, without going into too much detail, I have fully left the evangelical world. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say all evangelicals are bad or stupid, um, but having been in the evangelical world for 15 years, I can safely say there's nothing of value within that system for me to ever go back to yeah. ever again. I have friends that are part of the evangelical world, love them to death. Yeah. Um, there are even some pastors that I think teach good messages and are genuinely good people in that world. But if you were telling me, Hey man, uh, this next, uh, there's a job that's going to pay you 500 grand a year. It's in an evangelical church. I probably wouldn't take it. Really? No, that's insane. Uh, I've left money on the table in the past five years because I just can't go back to it. And you know what? I can, it's funny because I'm going to retract what I said. That's insane. But at the same time, like I've I've put my foot down for quite a few things. And one of one of my biggest struggles has been in corporate America. Sure. And that's something that from the time I graduated college and I dove into the corporate America world and really trying to make a name for myself, being successful, working on working at the building, not being on the clock just to make sure I can learn more like right. made all the sacrifices. But it's funny how how quickly they'll turn around and be like, Oh, wow. I never needed you. You know what I'm saying? So it's to me, I, I get where you're coming from, not from the church perspective, sure. from the corporate America world. But so go back. Right. And you're currently working in that environment. And obviously you've been you've had this page up for a while and you've sure. been, you've carried this type of belief for a significant amount of time. Right. Sure. So how has that affected you with the churches that you've worked with? Like so. Uh, let's see, it probably hasn't quite been a year yet, but I literally got fired from the last church I was at because of 
I call it LRD, but leave religion defenseless yeah. because of that. Well, we'll LRD. Everybody knows what yeah. we're talking about. But if you want to search us online, leave religion defenses. I don't know what comes up. Maybe a car or something. I don't know. LRD, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure there's some other things you probably yes. don't want to find, but, uh, <laughs> or maybe you do. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I've literally lost my job. The thing that helps put food on my table for my kids, for my wife, for myself to feed our great Dane. Like I lost wow. a job in an instant. I showed up on a Sunday, did my job, a good job, by the way, um, and then got pulled in the pastor's office. And he was like, hey, man, I know when you got hired two, almost three years ago, uh, you were very transparent with us and told us about your channel and, and who you were. And uh, the theological differences seem minor. We had no problems with it. Um, but we're basically taking all that back. <clears throat> and uh, we have a huge problem with what you're doing now. I'm not doing anything different than I was three years ago, except putting out more content. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think maybe was the kicker for them got more popular in the meantime. I mean, yeah. we're nowhere like in y'all's ballpark, but for what we do, like we, we make a decent splash. And I think because it was getting recognition, it, he couldn't hide it, you know? Anymore. Yeah. And so he literally pulled me in the office. No, no, this is what he did. As I'm getting up on stage, he sends me a text knowing I can't respond to it or even read it. Yeah. I'm literally walking up on stage, sends me a text. Hey man, I need you to meet me in my office afterwards. I knew. Yeah. I knew right then and there what was about to happen. This ain't my first rodeo, bro. <laughs> so, so we do, we do the, the worship set and everything. He preaches his message and uh, my wife was there and I was like, Hey, uh, I'm gonna pack up some stuff. I'll meet you in the car. Yeah. Um, my wife can be a little fiery sometimes. I mean, you know, Christina, yes. she, she can get a little hot and uh, <laughs> I love her to death and she'll, she'll fight for me tooth and nail, which is why I was like, I didn't tell her what was going on. It was like, Hey, I need a few minutes. I got to pack up some stuff. You can go sit in the car, FaceTime your mom, like whatever you want to do. Yeah. I think she'll tell you now she knew something was up. I don't know if she knew anything. Was up. <laughs> uh, so I sent her out to the car and I went to his office and I sit down and he's like, Hey man. Uh, and I could tell he didn't know how, he wanted to do yeah. this. He's also not a very, um, there's actually quite a lot of pastors like this, which I find interesting. They don't love confrontation. They don't really yeah. actually know how to fire people or how to deal with confrontation. It, like you say that not to interrupt you, but I, I understand, I get where you're coming from. It's kind of, it's kind of a weird street because those uh, pastors will stand up on stage and, and look at everyone in the eye and be like, are you doing drugs on a Saturday sure, night? Sure. And then you're coming to church. Like you need to check your faith. Right. But then when you get in the closed door and they're like, got to deliver news, it's like, Hey, well, um, yeah, well, well, I think he knew, look, if they wanted to let me go because of beliefs or because of doctrinal differences or whatever language you want to put to it, yeah. fine. Once again, this ain't my first rodeo, but you give somebody a runway, right? Like I've been there Honestly, bro, I'd taken one Sunday off a year. Yeah. Like doing my job well. Yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to be like mean or anything because I know this is just what the church could afford, but also being underpaid at the same time. Yeah. I knew I could go to another church uh, and make considerable amount more money. Now, I'll be 100% honest with you. I wasn't there because like I totally loved the church. We had to move from our last job from Newport Ritchie back to Lakeland and uh, right in the middle of COVID, right in the middle of the pandemic, we needed something. That's what was available. I, I got to support my family. Got to yeah. take it. Um, when we took the job, there was always kind of a, uh, hey, in six months or so, when COVID's over and we kind of get back to whatever normal looks like in church, because yeah. churches were shut down for a minute. Yeah. Um, we'll have a conversation about upping your salary, putting, you know, and so that was always kind of there, but I always kind of knew that probably wasn't gonna not going to happen. happen. Um, so anyway, bro, you want to let me go? You want to fire me? I'm not your guy anymore. That's fine. But a two-week notice, a one-month notice, a, hey, why don't you chill out a little bit on your channel, help us find somebody to replace you, and we'll send you off in a good way. You know, yeah. We'll make it a celebration. Instead, he pulls me in his office and says, this isn't working anymore. Don't come back next week. And I literally said, can we come back to say bye to all the people we'd been in church with for yeah. the past almost three years? And he's like, no. Made me sign an NDA right there saying I wouldn't say a word or I wouldn't get my severance, which was a one month severance. One <laughs> month is not enough time to find a new job yeah. with zero notice. That's pretty terrible. Um, I actually Googled it. Most people who lose their jobs, not even just the church world, but the average to find a new job after you've been laid off is about 90 days. Yeah. One month severance isn't going to cut it. No. So that literally cut our household income in half in an instant. 
And so I think it was handled very poorly. Um, and so to kind of go back and answer your question, yeah, yeah, no, it's totally it's, like bit me <laughs> in the butt. And that was, like I said, that was when I knew like, there's just no way I could ever go back to the evangelical world again, yeah. um, without telling you what kind of church, uh, or, or where I'm at now, it's not an evangelical church. Yeah. Um, and they don't hate people, which is nice. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that was when I, when I got this new job, I got hired <clears throat> actually next week is my 90 days, first 90 days there. Nice. Um, and so when, when <clears throat> we took this new job, that was on the forefront. Like, how do you treat people? That's what we care about. Yeah. Um, and finding out that everybody's equal in their church, that they don't discriminate against any colors, sexes, races. Like, they just want to love people. And then they yeah. have a huge homeless uh, outreach ministry. Uh, they give money to schools and like, they're very community based. Yeah. Um, so I would call it outward thinking versus inward thinking. Um, a lot of churches are, let's bring in people with the whole goal of just filling up our church. And then we serve the people inside of our church. And then maybe we'll like blow up some bounce houses on Halloween or something. <laughs> and kids can have a free hot dog. The kids can have a free uh, hot dog. But the reverse of that, which I think is yeah. a much healthier way to do church. I'm trying to put this concoction together you made. Oh, yeah. Go for but it. But continue. Well, I was going to say the reverse of that, which I think is way more healthy, is um, how do we, with our members in our church, uh, really pour into the community around us? How do we help the least of those around us? I think that's the way most churches should be handling their finances, should be handling how they go about being a community of people who claim to follow Jesus, the guy who literally would take his shirt off his back and give it to anybody, um, versus building churches to just uh, feed themselves and their own self-interest, which is more than... It's it's likely, especially in the evangelical world, that that's what's happening. Uh, yeah. Now they they like I said, they'll do a bunch of things to kind of mask that's the fact. But I guarantee you, if anybody's watching, uh, ask your church how much money, how much the revenue that the church pulls in goes out. Yeah, that that's a great question. Yeah, uh, no, it is. You, I would be shocked, absolutely shocked, if it's over if it's over twenty percent my mind would be blown. Yeah. If it's over 10%, I'd be like, wow, like that's great. If it's somewhere between three and 5%, I think you found yourself in an evangelical church. Really? Three, three to 5% of what they take in actually goes out and doesn't serve their own self-interest because yeah. what, what you'll see is a lot of them like, Oh, we're going to do community events. But the whole goal of the community event isn't it's, to serve. It's to it's get to, more people to come in. Right. That's how they mask those kind of things. Wow. That's and I oh, man, I don't want to sound like a stick in the mud, bro. Like, <laughs> I don't want to sound like, oh, churches are dumb and they should all be closed down. It's all bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like that a lot of yeah. times. And I just I want to get back to the actual tenets of like Jesus and the Bible, which is lay your life down for people. Yeah. That seems to be the whole goal. But if we have churches built around serving their own self-interest, it doesn't seem like we're laying our lives down. It seems like we're using people to get what we want out of them. That's scary to me. Because yeah. Look, man, corporations do it. All right, they're corporations. Uh, governments do it. All right, they're corporations. But when you do it in the name of Jesus and God, if you believe in Jesus of God, you should probably be upset with that. Yeah. Because it's a total misrepresentation of what it's all about. The representation of Jesus and God is, to me, has always been do more for others than you do for yourself. Right. That's if, putting it into one sentence. Right. But if you have systems built, built to do more for themselves. Now, here's the crux of it all. Most people who go to these churches are oblivious. And I don't mean that in a they're stupid way. Yeah. I mean, they don't even know. Like when I say the so how the sausage gets made, yeah. they don't even know, bro. They give their money every week. They believe they're giving to, uh, first off, they're taught in church that they're supposed to give their 10% to God. And I don't, I don't want to go into all the theology of that, but yeah. most of it's bogus and BS anyway. Um, but they give faithfully. They truly believe they're giving to God. And then the system that they're giving it to is really using it to benefit the system versus actually letting God do what money was intended to do, which is to help the poor, the widow, the homeless, the orphan. I mean, that's literally what the Bible yeah. says. Um, but if you're doing it to buy bigger lights and speakers for your sound system so you can put more people in your church... Now, yeah. now the churches will say, but, but brother, this is where people come to get healed and saved, I, I guess... Yeah, I guess, but then you got like hurricanes hitting Texas, and Joel Osteen closes his church off and doesn't let like people seek shelter wow. because a pipe burst. Yeah, you know, and I'm not trying to pick on one particular person. I'm just saying 
it saddens me because I think the people who are actually invested in church, good families, working American, like people who love God, read their Bibles, are invested in a system that I don't think they understand is super corrupt in a lot of different ways. Yeah. That's not every church, but it's most that I've seen and been a part of. And it, oh God, it's it's funny because as as you're as you're going, I'm kind of there's like dominoes falling for me a little bit. You said at the beginning that now we're we're in a in a new generation that's coming up. The youngest generation um, literally stays out of that. Yep. Do you think that, like example, like uh, channels like yours, right, are giving them a little bit more knowledge and under or seeing these things a little bit more? Whereas an older generation, you'd call like the boomers, right? Which remember when I was coming up, my parents were a part of that generation. Sure. It was just shut up, do what you're told, right? And don't ask questions. Right. And like now we're in that generation where it's like asking questions. Do you think that is a correlation of why we're seeing less and less people in church? Well, so I think it, yes, absolutely. But I think it even goes deeper. I mean, think about um, what year were you born? 88. Okay. I was born in 87 in yeah. December of 87. So it might as well have been 88. Mm -hmm. We grew up with dial up internet. Absolutely. Um, a after what, 12, 13 years? Yeah. Something like uh, that. So you remember being on like Yahoo Messenger or AOL online. Dude, aim all aim, day. All day, chatting your buddies, <laughs> um, you know, having a Zanga or maybe a, like a, a MySpace when it first came. Yes. So our generation literally grew up in the birth of the information age. Yes. Um, you know, to where your parents' generation might have grown up in the birth of like the TV age or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So information for people like us since we were 12, 13 has been readily available. Yep. And not just information, but social interaction. You could go online right now on your phone and talk with somebody in Taiwan. Right now, you could do it. Yeah. Never in history has that ever been possible. You can also go online right now and find a bunch of people who've been hurt by churches and hear their stories and communicate and find out that maybe this is a bigger problem than we thought. So yeah. I think, yes, I do think channels like mine and others who are doing uh, what a lot of us call deconstructing, tearing down bad religion, and then some of us choose to uh, or are led to or whatever language you want to put on it, uh, build something stronger with a better foundation uh, that does have a religious tie, still yeah. believe in Jesus, still believe in God. Some people deconstruct and say, it's not real. Christianity, God, the Bible, it's all fake. Um, and that's where they land. And I'm not here to throw shade at anybody, like wherever you land. But I do know that a lot of people have gone into that deconstruction mode because of how they've been treated by the church. And I think what the information age and the internet has allowed us to do is it's not just the one Baptist preacher uh, in a Baptist church on a dirt road in central Georgia mistreating his congregation and no one hears about it, yeah. right? Now, when stuff like that happens, the whole world hears about it. Yeah. And then someone's like, oh my gosh, that happened at my church. That also happened at my cousin's church over in Oklahoma. Now we start putting all these pieces together and now people have pretty big skepticism for the entire system that is known as Christianity, at least here in America. Yeah. And so I think the information age, the ability to share information and communicate with people is a big reason why, pe why people aren't in the dark anymore. They can yeah. see what's going on. Yeah. No, I, I get that, man. And, and it, it's so, to me, it's, it's always very mind blowing when you start seeing these things. Cause I'm honestly, I'll tell you by nature, I'm one of those people that just like, okay, yeah, uh, yeah. Do it, do what you're told. <laughs> right, right. And right. and as as I've grown and as I've I would say aged, right? As I've aged, I've gained wisdom and I've understood like I don't have to take everyone's simplistic path. But at the same time, my experience too, especially when I was younger, was there was there were certain points in time in my personal life where we were fell on some seriously hard times and and you know, we, I, I guess if you want to say, we were kind of looked down upon sure. by, by, by a specific church community. Right. And it was kind of like, oh, you know, don't talk to that guy. You know sure. what I'm saying? Whereas I've gotten older and now especially, you know, listening to you talk and watching your channel, especially a lot of your clips that have come out, it's like, it's kind of opened the other door for me than what we just talked about. It's like, okay, not every church is like this. And it's right. like, you can, I can bring a lot of my friends. Cause honestly, I have, I have a lot of friends. Like you said, I've, I have a lot of friends that are, you know, gay. There are some that, sure. you know, I probably it's certain. Yeah. As a matter of fact, transgender, there's right. been a lot of different people and, well, and it's, it's very unique, I guess. And those are the 
big kind of things that are socially big. I've yeah. literally been threatened to be kicked out of a church because of having this. Yeah. I am the farthest thing from an alcoholic. Yeah. It's very rare that I even have a drink, but they're awesome. And I like playing with them and a good <laughs> <Yeah>. craft beer <laughs> yeah. hits sometimes. If I'm out uh, you know, at dinner with my wife and she yeah. wants some wine, then we're going to have some wine. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, we handle it responsibly. We don't drink and drive. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, but I've literally been at churches. I've been employed by churches where in the contract of me getting signed to that church as an employee said, I will not consume alcohol. Now, there's nowhere in the Bible where it says don't consume alcohol. Yeah. But that was their standards. Yeah. And so now I have to say, so I live my standards by my employer under God more so than I do Jesus making a bunch of wine for people at a wedding and saying, let's go. Yeah. You can read into that what you want to. Yeah. But what I'm saying is it's not always as big as like, oh, uh, you know, my cousin was gay and they won't let him go back to church anymore. Sometimes people get kicked out of church because they like to have a beer. That's sometimes yeah. people get kicked out of church because they revoke, uh, refuse to vote for a particular political party. I'm not kidding. Like that happens. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people get kicked out of church, uh, because, uh, somebody is having an addiction uh, issue. Like the, the episode, um, like you did your first episode, yeah, I think first with your episode brother, with Chris, yeah. bro, people like your brother, I don't know what his background is in church and stuff like that, but when he was going through his hard time, a lot of churches talk a big game about helping people and they have programs called like celebrate recovery. But when a dude's in it, like in it, in it, they're probably going to bounce. Really? And it's funny because honestly, part of, part of Chris's uh, steps, he's, he's become unbelievably religious. Like he still, he keeps true to his nature. Sure. Like, you know, like <laughs> that's the best way to put it. Bro. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> he keeps true to his nature, which you guys have all seen Sure, sure. and hilarious dude, no doubt about it. But if, if we ever get serious for a moment and we ever just like have like an in-depth conversation or there's a problem or a conflict, he's the first one he'll, sure. he'll whip out scripture. Right. And it's like, it's pretty impressive to see that, but I guess it's, to me, it's kind of baffling because you're saying on the other end, there are some, not obviously not all, sure. some that would be like, hey, mm, you got to, nah. Well, I think what happens is it's, it's that house of cards thing. So once people get outside of what I would call an abusive relationship with the church, yeah. um, that first card gets pulled and then the whole thing crumbles down. And so not only is it the system was bad, this church mistreated me, this pastor mistreated me, the community I've been with my whole life now and nothing wants nothing to do with me it also can turn into like most things with unforgiveness and like that stuff eats away at you bro yeah uh whether it's religious whether it's stuff with your parents stuff with your spouse your ex-spouse all kinds of stuff like stuff can eat at you and i think what happens a lot of times is people don't know how to separate the bad that people have done to them from the bad they want to associate it with God, with the Bible, yeah. with Jesus. Now, I am not here to judge anyone's journey. If that's where you've landed in your life, I'm still with you, man. Like you still have a friend in me and I I don't discriminate or hate against anybody because we don't know where people come from. Yeah. But I will say, and I would throw caution to people, don't always throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because church sucks sometimes doesn't necessarily mean there is no God or that the Bible is totally fake or that religion was just built to profit off of people, although that's probably right. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is if you believe in a creator, if you believe in Jesus, I don't think just because churches are bad, you necessarily have to go down the path of saying, there is no God, it's not real, it's all fake. Yeah. If you've landed there, okay, fine. Um, but I don't know that that always has to be the logical conclusion. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that people get shocked, at, dude, like go look at some of my videos in the comments, people are like, wait, is this dude still a Christian? Like, wait, does this yeah. guy still believe in God? <laughs> People get real confused real quick because I'll be the first one to jump at the bully that I call the evangelical church. Yeah. But I've also somehow made it through the gauntlet and still believe in God. Yeah. And I think the best thing I could give to people is, uh, and I don't know that I've ever heard another Christian say this, so maybe I'll get canceled for saying it. I can't prove God exists. I never will. No pastor can no one. I will sit here fully right now and tell you I could be totally dead wrong, fully dead wrong Yeah. because God was never meant to be proven. You won't find any passage in the Bible that says, do this and you'll be able to prove to people that I exist. It's not there. Yeah. You have a bunch of miracles in the Bible. You have Jesus. Uh, but for a lot of people, that's not enough. 
I'll sit here and tell you my faith in God, in Jesus, in the Bible for the most part, um, simply relies on the fact that I choose to have faith because that's what faith is. It's a choice. It's literally, pastors will say this from a pulpit, it's believing in the unseen. If you can't see it, you can't prove it. And if you can't prove it, then how do you know it's real? And the answer is for every single human in the world, whether they're Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, it doesn't matter where you are, you can't prove there's a creator of the universe, no matter where you come from. So at some point, you have to choose. And what I think what's profound for people like your brother is he can quote scripture and it has a profound impact on his journey right now, much like it has a profound impact on my journey. I do believe my faith makes me a better father, makes me a better husband, makes me generally just a better human to be around. And if that's all I get out of life and I die and it's just black, and there's <laughs> nothing left, I still think it would have been worth it because it added value to my life because I was able to love people better than if I just relied on my own devices. Cause my own devices suck. Yeah. Uh, without Jesus, I am a garbage human being. Not just, and I feel like a lot of people say that. I mean that truly. Like I would be a horrible person. And there have been times in my life where I don't, I wouldn't say I stopped believing, but I walked away from trying to follow that path and I was a horrible individual. Yeah. And and I burned a lot of bridges and I hurt a lot of people, including myself. Um, And so now sitting here at almost 36 years old, I believe in Jesus because I choose to believe in Jesus. Not that I'm saying like, I hold all the cards and I have the power. I fully submit to the idea that God and Jesus could be real and that the the tenets of that faith, which is lay your life down for others, yeah. um, uh, treat others how you would want to be treated. Um, I believe those tenets make me a better human being. So yeah. they're worth following. But if you ask me straight up, so you're telling me there's God. I'm not telling you there's a God. I have no idea. And if I said I can prove to you there's God, I'm an idiot. Because the Bible actually doesn't give us the latitude to do that or say that. Yeah, this jacks up a lot of people. Yeah, because they want me to say, "Oh no, man, God's real. Like He's totally real, and He's for you." And and, and, and ready, and ready, yeah. and people get all up in arms because what you and correct me if I'm wrong here, what you say is, "Oh, I have no idea," but I choose to believe that there is. And I don't just choose like. I'm not just saying like, I believe the Boston Celtics are going to win the title next year. It's, I don't base my life on this. I mean, I love the Celtics, but I don't base <laughs> my life around them winning a championship. I do. When I say I believe, I mean, I'm all in. Yeah. And, but still knowing in the back of my mind that I'm still relying 100% on faith. Mm-hmm. If God never speaks to me, if God never shows himself to me, if I never see a miracle, if my kids die in a car accident tomorrow, And my whole life just gets wrecked. I'm still choosing to believe. Yeah. And I think that's where the rubber meets the road because now there's, there's no, I think submitted to the idea is the best way to say it. I've just laid down and said, I'm just going to go where this takes me. And I'm choosing to believe in this and I'm choosing to live by the tenets of this faith. Yeah. Um, and that freaks a lot of people out. It's it's funny you say that because I know for a fact if you said that around a certain amount of people, especially pastors in general, like the, the phrase, the exact phrase you said, I don't know, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna lay here and see where it takes me. They would be like, No, absolutely not, and it it causes a huge conflict. So I I totally get where you're coming from with that, dude. It's 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 a cool, it's a very unique road to go down. So, I, and I don't think it's as far removed from biblical concepts as people think, because uh, you'll hear people say in church all the time, uh, salvation is through grace, through, yeah. through God's grace to us, through Jesus dying on the cross, but yeah. it's also through faith alone. Without faith, you can't be saved. I mean, Jesus straight, straight up says that, without faith. So at some point that rubber has to meet the road. So yeah. if you are just so convinced that God exists and you are just like locked into that idea, it, you may be shattered or your faith may be shattered when you have to start proving it. And I hate all these Christians that are out there. I mean, you can find them on TikTok, Instagram, be like, uh, proof that God exists and look at this passage and look what's happening in the news today. I'm like, you're an idiot. None of this (laughs) proves anything. It just, it proves that you can correlate anything. Yeah. You know, you can make anything sound like it fits together. You can make anything sound like the conclusion you want. Sure. Uh, And that's kind of the world we live in today. Yeah. Um, So, I know it's tough for like diehard Christians to hear that, but I think at the end of the day, um, I base everything I do in my life off the idea 
uh, that I'm choosing to put my faith in Jesus and I'm yeah. choosing to believe he is who he says he is because him, God, and and what they represent is enough for me. And yeah. it's enough for me to not be a D bag anymore and yeah. actually find out <laughs> what life is like when you love people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like I said, it's maybe a better parent, better, uh, better husband. I think genuinely a, a better person. And if that's all I get out of it, I believe it's enough. I was going to say, I, th- I feel like that's a pretty good trade off. Cause I, I understand where you're coming from, man. Cause you know how it is. Every person has their own dark path or sure. their own unique path that they've walked it may not be dark, but, um, I've, I've been in those particular scenarios. And, and the one thing that I can say, cause, um, I can, I can tell you right now for sure. I'm, I definitely share the same belief, but I'm also still learning, mm-hmm. understanding more, um, but it's more it's more along the lines of I think I relate it to how I personally feel. If I've done something that where I've been a complete asshole to sure. somebody, it's it's there. Sure. There's a reason why I feel that way. Sure. There's something that's telling me like, nah, you should probably fix this shit. You right, know what I'm saying? Right. You should probably not do that shit again. So I, I get where you're coming from with that. So one thing I do want to switch to, um, you have like we talked about, you have your YouTube platform, but you also uh, release small clips here and there. Right. But you have you have very long podcasts, right? Yeah. But you have multiple topics in each one, right? So what would you say in, in, in the last, let's say six months, has been your biggest topic that you've released? Because your big ones... I, I know for a fact they go on TikTok. Sure. And you isolate an individual passage where sometimes there's a pastor that's reading it and you're like, that doesn't make right, sense. That's not right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think in the last six months or so, like we've kind of pivoted, I would say in the last year or so. Yeah. Um, my wife helps me a ton. Um, she's on, I think, every podcast we've done. Um, and so for a while, the beginnings of Leave Religion Defenseless was very deep, heavy theological dives, digging into scripture, pulling out, like you said, when somebody says something, that's actually not what the Bible is trying to communicate to you. And we would break that down exhaustively. Yeah. I don't think people were into it. <laughs> yeah. Like if I'm being honest, <laughs> I get real nerdy about it, you know? Yeah. Um, but it, it's like trying to explain to my wife a plus minus score on the Boston Celtics. Like she tunes out at some point, you know? Yeah. She's like, I like Jason Tatum. He's cool. <laughs> but, you know, like. You remember we sat on the court side that one <laughs> time. He looked real tall. <laughs> but I've learned there's, there's a certain depth most people aren't willing to go in a lot of things. Like you and I could probably have a very nerdy conversation yeah. about uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Absolutely. Like we could go stupid deep. Zero doubt, baby. Right. Let's go. But there are a lot of Marvel fans out there that are very, uh, not in a mean way, but casual Marvel fans. They see every movie, they watch every show, but they probably couldn't go to where we want to go with it. I would immediately throw out, hey, do you remember what Captain America said in the second movie? And through, right. I, I lost you. Right, yeah. right. Uh, and I think uh, Christianity's like that in a yeah. lot of ways. So the beginnings of Leave Religion Defenseless were the nerdy MCU conversations about the Bible, about yeah. Jesus and faith. And I think people couldn't, I don't want to say couldn't handle it like I'm some sort of elitist and I'm giving information. A lot of the stuff is retreading ground that deep scholarly work uh, has that has been done about the Bible. Uh, and, a, and a quick side note, <clears throat> you'll notice if you ever dive into like deep theological works, uh, studying and understanding the Bible, there's an academic side of Christianity. Yeah. And then there's church mm-hmm. and they barely meet. I mean, the real academic, the real, heavy, I was going to say, work. those are the ones that you see, uh, like, uh, the, the Da Vinci code, someone in that type of ideal position it's going super deep, breaking every single word down in the Greek or in the Hebrew, explaining like what the actual definitions of why the English translation isn't correct. Why we, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, most people I found at least based off what our channel has done, can't or don't want to go that deep. Yeah. So I would say in the first year or so that we hit that stuff hard. Then we slowly started pivoting to more cultural stuff, especially since the whole deconstruction movement has really taken off um, and really focusing more culturally what's happening in yeah. churches and, and how do we address those kind of issues. Yeah. Define the the term deconstruction because and define the movement because yeah. I think some people may not know what that is. This one's really tricky because deconstruction, I've learned, means something different to almost every person that's going through it. Yeah. Uh, for some people, deconstruction, like I said earlier, means just getting rid of your faith completely and understanding God is not real and now what do I do with my life and rebuilding their life without God, the Bible, church, Jesus. That sounds more like abandonment. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think for them, they would say it's enlightenment. They would say they've they've seen the light, that religion is all a hoax and it's all fake. And now how am I going to live my life if I've been indoctrinated for 18 years inside the church? Now what do I do? Yeah. So they would say deconstructed. It, it literally means exactly what it is. You are tearing something down. You are deconstructing something. Uh, I tell people all the time, imagine you have a, um, a three-story brick building. I think dangerous deconstruction looks like taking a wrecking ball and just plowing through that and say, this building sucked from the beginning. There's nothing good about it (laughs) and I'm done with it. Yeah. And for some people, I understand the impulse because I mean, we don't know the trauma that some people go through with church. Like imagine you've been in church your whole life and uh, just to hit a hot button issue, uh, you are gay. And now you tell your family and you tell your pastor at the age of 22, 23 and they're like, Oh, well, then you can't be a part of this anymore. And God hates you, by the way. Take that in. Yeah. And now we start to understand how someone could be like, well, if God's not for me, I'm not for God. And this must all be fake because I thought God loved me. Yeah. This stuff gets deep, internal. Like there's some deep wounds and a lot of people don't know how to sift through that. So the easier thing to do is just kick it all down. It's the difference between divorce and marriage counseling. Sometimes it's just easier to walk away and like, this is your, uh, we can't, we can't solve these problems. We can't talk it out. It's too hard. And both people just decide to sign the papers and be done with it when there probably, or maybe was a better solution. They could have worked through their issues. They could have found out what upset the other person, whatever the case may be. Right. And so I think on my end, I was too scared. If I'm being honest, I was too scared to take a wrecking ball to it because my whole life was built around it. I literally went to college for a music ministry and theology degree. And so I think for me, when some stuff hit the fan in my personal life, um, I think I was honestly too much of a coward to tear it all down. If I'm being honest, I don't want to sound like I'm some like holier than thou, smarter than I was terrified. Yeah. I didn't want to know what life was like without a God. That was your entire life all right. the way up. And for a lot of people, that's the case. So I think for me, being a coward, I just decided to take one brick at a time, look at it and be like, oh, this brick sucks. We need, <laughs> we need to replace this with a better brick. Yeah. Uh, this one's okay. We'll put that one back. I've been in that process for close to 10 years now. So my deconstruction didn't look like a wrecking ball versus taking a brick at a time examining it and trying to build a stronger building at the end of one that I could peacefully live in for a lot of deconstructionists. They're scared to do that because the walls are creaking. Yeah. Because when storms hit the foundation rattles a little bit and it makes them very uneasy. Nobody wants to live in a shaky house, right? Like that's, and I think that's what religion God is for a lot of people. And if you've seen the dark side of Christianity and it makes you question God and your faith, Nobody wants to live in a creaky house, bro. Yeah. And so I think different people, different personalities are going to react to that differently. I think my hyper analytical brain said, no, I'm checking every freaking brick. <laughs> like yeah. We're going to find out where yeah. this problem is. I'm going to figure this out, bro. Now, like, for a lot of people, the foundation is bad. The The house is bad from the foundation. And at that point, you just got to tear the whole thing down. I mean, yeah. I, I, I can't remember, but there's, there's plenty of documentaries like on Netflix and Hulu about like crazy cults that were like kind of loosely based on like the Duggars and stuff like that. Yeah. The foundation's bad. There's almost nothing positive to go back to. So for people like that, they might need to take a wrecking ball to it and pour a new foundation and then start building brick by brick. Yeah. And some people do that. I, I've met a lot of people who deconstruct who for the first year to five years like no god doesn't exist and then year six year seven year hit and they're like well i started to read a little bit and i'm start i'm coming around they're putting yeah. their bricks back and that's not everybody and if that's not the case that's fine too i don't judge anybody who's gone through any kind of deconstruction but literally deconstruction means it's different for everybody but it literally means tearing the thing down and then building something in its place What people build in its place is where the variables happen. Do you build back a Christian faith? Do you build back more of an atheist slant? Do you maybe go and start like buying crystals and move to the desert and start doing peyote? I mean, you know. Vegas, baby. Everybody does it different. And I think that's why what deconstruction is, is kind of hard to pin down. But I think at the end of it, it's noticing there's a problem with the house. Now, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. That's crazy. Okay. So... What would you, gosh, what what kind of advice would you give to somebody that's in that particular arena where they're having all these conflicts? Like, where would you suggest them to go? Because a lot of people would say, oh, you need to go to someone in the church. Yeah. You know? 
uh, I'll answer, but I'll tell you like a quick story. I was at a Halloween party like five years ago, uh, and it was a normal, like there's like some 20 year olds there, 30 year olds, people are drinking. It's a Halloween party. It's just yeah. a normal Halloween party. My friend invites me. He's a good friend of mine. We're hanging out. I think me and Christina dressed up like purge people. So like, you know, <laughs> um, and so we show up at this party, chilling, just having a couple drinks, having a good time. It's not a rager, but it's just a good, like th- yeah, it's 30 a year old party. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be in bed by 10. Yeah. 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 Like, what time? <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, so we're hanging out this, I say kid, he's probably in his younger twenties, walks up to me, uh, Spanish kid. Um, and he walks up to me and he's like, Hey man, you're a pastor, right? <laughs> Like, got a beer in my hand, <laughs> blood on my shirt. Yeah, bro. <laughs> yeah, man, pastor. Uh, and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And I'm like, oh, sure. Normally when someone says that to someone like me, like maybe their family member died or like something, you know, something happened. Now it's time to. Right. Like I got to put that hat on for a second and like come, come out of party mode. So he's like, all right, you walk with me. So he literally takes me in the garage and it's a garage. Like there's a lawnmower and like roaches and like, you know, <laughs> just a garage in yeah. like a normal suburban house. And uh, I'd never met this dude in my life before. And he said, uh, hey, man, I grew up in church my whole life. Um, my mom's big into the church world. My dad died when he was young. Church was our family. Like, we, you know, potlucks, Sunday morning, Wednesday nights, like church was <clears throat> it. Youth group, like every Wednesday, like church was my life. And he's like, um, when I turned 17, I really knew I was gay. And so I went and sat down with my youth pastor and I told him. And then two days later... Uh, I was brought into a room with the youth pastor, the head pastor, and like a bunch of these other people. And they basically told me um, that being gay was a sin, uh, that I was going to hell. And if I didn't repent and change who I was, uh, not only could I not come back to the church, but I was going to burn in hell forever. And basically, they just made me feel like a disgusting human being. I will confidently say no 17 year old on the planet is equipped to deal with that. Yeah. That you, you're not mentally, emotionally ready for that. Most 30 year olds aren't ready for that. Um, but they did that to that kid. No, I think he said he was 15. So, uh, so in an instant, boom, his whole life just kind of fell apart. Now for him, he's gay. You're not changing that. That's who he is. That's, you know, and so he left the church, got a whole new group of friends said he kind of still had a decent relationship with his mom, but that definitely like, cause she stayed with the church and he's on rocks, right? It, it caused a big problem. So he's like, so he, he kind of quickly explains that story to me. And then he says, um, you know, I've been waking up every night for the past month, having dreams about Jesus, having dreams about going back to church. Um, and he's like, I saw you at the party and somebody mentioned your pastor. And he's like, it's like a bell rung in my head. He's like, I just got to talk to this dude. He's like, what should I do? And Instantly, I don't know if it was my conscience. I don't know if it, you know, instantly I had an answer. I was like, don't go back to church. Whatever you do, bro. Because what's going to happen is you're looking for family and they're going to chew you up and spit you out. Yeah. I said, don't go to church. And like as hard as I could. Yeah. And he looked at me like, what? Like you're a pastor. I was like, don't. Like stay away. He's like, well, what do I do? I was like, you need to find a group of friends who, uh, who say they love Jesus, who say they love God. And you need to meet up with them at a Starbucks or something and just have good people in your life who are willing to walk down this path with you. I said, but I can't confidently tell you to walk into any particular church that I knew at the time and they're not going to chew you up and spit you out. Because if there was an inkling left in him where there may be a path back to his faith, I felt like a church would squash it and crush it for him. So my advice to him in that moment was find healthy people who are willing to walk down whatever road you're on right now and uh, who are willing to have those conversations with you. Maybe you open up a Bible at Starbucks if that's what you guys want to do. Maybe you just have a conversation and just start talking to people about your faith again. But find a safe place where you can dip your toes back into that. Because if you try to dive back in, I'm afraid the wolves are going to eat you alive. And he looked at me very puzzled, but I could also tell he understood what I was saying. Understood it. So to go back to your original question, what would I say to people who are going through your deconstruction? It would be a variation of the same thing. Find safe spaces. Because if you're just going to try to dive back into the same place that hurt you, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. You know, like one of the worst things someone could do after their spouse cheats on them and leaves them is go on Tinder. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I'm saying? you're not gonna find much better right yeah like, you're not uh and it's the same kind of thing like maybe you go to like a pickleball court or you're, you're you know what i'm saying like you don't go from like emotional relationship trauma to trying to pick somebody up at a bar yeah. that's not going to heal whatever you just went through yeah 
Now, look, man, like, you know why you go to a bar to, to find uh, uh, somebody else for other things. Well, hold on. Hold on. Sometimes <laughs> I go to the bar because they they serve a great Jameson. Sure. Uh, but you're looking for Jameson, <laughs> right? Yeah. A little different. And, and I, I think it's the same thing for people. Uh, don't don't jump out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah. Find somewhere that you can have safe conversations with safe people who aren't going to chew you up and spit you out. Because the only thing that I'm ever trying to convince people of on our channel, I'm not right about everything. I may not even be right ha about half of the things I say on there. I try and I do everything I can to research. Yeah. Um, but what I think our channel is good at and what I think other deconstruction channels are good at is it's okay to ask questions. That's yeah. the biggest thing. It is okay to have questions. Jesus was okay with it. God's okay with it. Hyper-religious people typically are the ones who don't dig questions. Yeah. So you need That's to find true. safe spaces where you're allowed to ask questions, where you're allowed to maybe buck up against the norm. Yeah. If that's if Now, if you know of a church where you can do that, power to you that that sounds awesome Let's i go. haven't found it yet yeah personally me um and so i would say if you're going through deconstruction if you have questions about your faith you need to find safe spaces with people that you can actually trust because you also don't want to just go find the first like drunkard and be like hey tell me about jesus <laughs> you know like there needs to be some kind of uh, validity yeah. in these conversations yes, absolutely because uh, the other dark side of the deconstruction world is it can turn into a pity party sometimes it yeah. can literally just turn in people like, well, church sucks and they hurt me. And no, it turns into a corporate America meeting that you have in the morning. Hey, let's, let's talk about what are some experiences we're all having. And then right. 20 minutes later, it turns into everybody shitting on everything about what's going on. Right. It's, yeah. it's the typical, I just got out of a bad relationship. So all men suck or all women suck. Yeah. That's, and that's not logical. That's yeah. not real, but that's how we feel in the moment. Yeah. But that's not reality. And I think sometimes some of the deconstruction crowd can get stuck there yeah. because they haven't learned how to process or work through that trauma. And I want to reinforce stuff that happened to those people sucks and they never deserve to go through any of it. But that's true for almost all of us in some way or another, yeah. right? Most of us have things that have been done to us that we didn't deserve. Um, uh, whether we were kids, whether it's in relationships, um, most of us have been through unfair situations. Yeah, I think as an individual, as an adult, you have uh, an opportunity to say, okay, I'm a little pissed off right now. Yeah. That hurt. That was unfair. Um, but I teach my kids, life's not fair, bro. Yeah. You're going to get stepped on sometimes. Yeah. And you're not going to get retribution for it. And that person's probably going to, has a potential to profit off of that or, or to, to get further in life than you did because they took advantage of you. Cause that's how the world works sometimes. And it sucks. So you can either choose to wallow in that and woe is me and oh, life sucks. Or you can say, okay, but what am I going to do about it? How yeah. am I going to better myself through this situation? I also think that's very much my personality. Yeah. I remember in seventh grade, we were in a uh, gym class and there was a kid in our class who was uh, a little slow. Yeah. Great kid, a little slow. Um, and, I remember like we were playing dodgeball or something and the biggest kid, like dude, your size. Yeah. Biggest kid in class, just a jerk, you know, bully, typical, just grabbed a, one of those. I'm red, a typical asshole. <laughs> <laughs> grabbed one of those red dodgeballs and just beamed this oh, kid in the face. Oh, that's a fucking no, no, bro. Uh-uh. So everyone gasp, right? Because it's like wide. Like, Cause I think the kid like stepped on a shoe or something like that. Like definitely didn't reserve, yeah. deserve the response that he got. Prick. I was probably half a court away on the basketball court from this, and I booked. Now, I was 5'5", five, five, 120 soaking wet, yeah. you know, but I was fast. Uh, <laughs> and I booked it half court, and he didn't see me, and I just checked him in the back and launched him. And he got up and wailed on me, bro, Yeah. until like people pulled him off. They sit us both down in the office, and the principal was like, why? <laughs> like, yeah. what just happened? And I told the principal what he, do what he did. And, uh, and I was like, I'm not sorry. And I'd do it again. Cause that's garbage. Yeah. Like, big guys shouldn't be able to pick on little guys like that and get no response. And the fact that I took a couple to the face, it is what it is. So I think that's very much in my personality. That makes you a hero and a martyr. Well, I think it just means that like <laughs> some of us are not willing to stand around when people get abused. Yeah. And no, look, man, I'm not out on the front lines fighting any big war for anybody. I'm yeah. just on a YouTube and TikTok making, <laughs> but I think the idea is the same thing. Like I hate seeing people bullied and yeah. I tell my kids this all the time. Like you get in a fight at school, maybe we'll have a conversation. You make a bad grade. Maybe we'll have a conversation. But if I find out 
that you bully someone or you know of a kid who's being bullied and you didn't do something, I will check. We're going to have a problem. Yeah. Because that's just non negotiable in our house. Yeah. We don't let people get beat up on. That's just not okay. And I think that carries through in a lot of what we're doing with the LRD stuff. It's not about being a savior. It's not about knowing more than other people. It's about saying, dude, what happened to you sucked. But also, can I help you up? Can, yeah. can, can, can we go somewhere? I hope you don't want to lay there forever and cry in it. Because even though what happened sucked, yeah. laying there is not going to fix anything. Now what do we do? How can I help you get up? Bro, you know? that's incredible, dude. That is phenomenal. So I'm going to tell you right now. So unfortunately, this is the unfortunate part is I, I want to deep dive, as you know. But somebody close to you uh, works on our videos, and we got to keep them sure. in a certain time yeah. frame. <laughs> yeah. That guy's a huge jerk, too. Yeah. Yeah. So... So um, we're we're gonna skip through next time because you're gonna have to come back on. There's sure. no doubt. Right. So next time we're gonna do our bad decisions, make better right, stories. Yeah. We'll do that. Didn't do spice but, of the day. None of that stuff. I forgot all about. I was gonna say what what do we finish off with, bro? What is what is our finish off right now? It is the spice of the week. Spice of the week. I said spice of the day. That's my yeah. fault. Uh, spice of the week. Uh, do you normally give one or do, do, just or, the guest? No, okay. no, we 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 all do. However, I would like I would like to. Uh, I lost my train of thought because I'm so excited, fucking right now, <laughs> for the second time in the history of our podcast. Finally, have someone I don't have to explain spice of the week to, baby. Yeah. We're moving up in the world. Yeah, man. All right. So spice of the week. You go first, and then I'll go second. All right. Uh, I'm a huge movie nerd, bro. Yes. Gigantic. Um, oh, we did the... I, well, I know it wasn't this week, but Oppenheimer blew my mind. Yes. Um, I love good filmmaking. I love yes. good storytelling. And um, I love my kids. Yeah. I love my wife. But a well-constructed movie, bro. Yes. <laughs> like, not much is better than that. In my life. <laughs> I agree. Uh, and I, I, I've honestly, dude, I, I've been on a little bit of an Oppenheimer buzz for the past week. Dude, you're such an asshole right now. So <laughs> you have to say Oppenheimer is your spice of the week. It's so funny you said that because I was literally going to say my spice of the week was doing the double take on the okay. Barbie Oppenheimer. Right, right. No shit. So we have we have a simultaneous same uh, same spice of the week. But going to see that movie, not only did I get some education from it mm -hmm. because honestly, there's one thing I'm I'm very good at. I'm really good at getting really curious about something. I'll go down a rabbit hole sure. and I'll learn as much as possible. But one thing I won't do, I won't read a book. Sure. I can't do it. It's just not so in my nature. You didn't order American Prometheus. No. I did. <laughs> I totally did. <laughs> I did. I, did. I, did. So, I don't know that I'll read it. It might sit on my shelf, but I got it. Yeah, I can, and I'll tell people I read it. There you go. I saw the movie. <laughs> so that was that was honestly kind of the coolest thing. And and the reason why my reason is a little bit different, but when we went, it was like we left after work, right? And we decide, hey, we're gonna go see uh an awesome Barbie movie at first. <laughs> and but it was like nationwide. That's what everybody was doing. Sure, Let's sure, go sure. do the double header, yeah. right? So we get done and it's what, like one thirty in the morning. Yeah. So we so we did Barbie, then we went and had dinner and yes. we had Oppenheimer. Yes. Yeah. So, as a matter of fact, after dinner, we actually stopped at your place for a few minutes because played some 2K. <laughs> we played some yeah. 2K. I did get whooped twice. I'm 0 and 2 against this son of a bitch. That's all right. But either way, your boy's getting better because I downloaded 2K and I'm playing the career mode on normal. Look, not man, on rookie, I on normal. I won't even sit down and try to play Madden or PGA against you because I know it'll be so much worse. Exactly. Right. So, right. this is what's happening. Right. Either way, we get done with it and we get back, and it's like, I get back to that. I was like two o'clock, and I was like, man. When's the last time I did some kid shit where I just didn't matter <laughs> weekday work right. work week like don't care getting back at two I got to be up in four hours right yeah I was to me I was like yeah I'm a kid again right now sometimes you need those man that's sometimes you gotta let the hair down and be like consequences that's whatever bro that's fucked up you yeah. just said that yeah, <laughs> it is but oh, sorry too soon, too soon. <laughs> it too is soon. too soon so <laughs> dude. Dude, amazing. Honestly, my mind is blown. I can't get enough of this. Like, I, I don't want to fucking end this at all. You have to come back. Sure. I'm getting it on camera right now so right, that you right. commit to it. Yeah. Um, you bring I'm, the Casamigas, I'll bring the... Abs every time. I'll bring the church matter. drama, baby. There you go. <laughs> so um, why don't we, like, let's yep. spend 30 seconds. Uh, dive into the camera right now. Tell us where we can find you in your platform. Yeah. Uh, so just search Leave Religion Defenseless literally anywhere. It's Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts. That's the full podcast, the audio version. We're on TikTok. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. 
Uh, I'm not on Twitter or X or whatever it is now. I just, I'm not going to yeah. do it. Elon's kind of killing me on that, but, uh, yeah. uh, but yeah, so check us out anywhere. Uh, like I said, there's, I feel like if you're decently, um, interested in religion, more specifically like evangelical Christianity, there's probably something in there for every flavor of that. You can do the deep theological stuff. Uh, we talk about cultural Christianity stuff that's happening today. Uh, we did a big sex in the Bible podcast. A lot of people like that one. Honestly, yeah. that was our highest viewed podcast. Yeah. <laughs> the moment you say sex and Bible, people are like, I got to find out. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I think there's, uh, if you're decently interested in any of the stuff we talked about today, I think there's something on the channel for you. Uh, and like I said, it's really just all about having good conversations. We're not trying to be elitist. We're not trying to say we know more than other people we just want to have good conversations so in the comment section is typically where that lights up and i i i'm gonna be one that kind of piggybacks on this because uh this is a podcast this is one of the first podcasts i started listening to which is what inspired us to want to do something like this and create our own platform but i thought it was a very unique take and it was it was interesting to me because i whenever i walked into a church whenever i did something in this particular realm there was always there's only one lane there is no such thing as a second lane. You stay in order. Sure. This is it. You wait your time. And then when I heard a couple of the clips, I was like, holy shit, this is different. And even if you're even if you're somewhat interested or you have any type of faith, or even if you find the conversation interesting, I'm telling you, whenever you get a chance, go check them out. I know the moment you check them out, I know you'll hit the subscribe button. So I'm not even gonna tell you to subscribe because it's it's a very interesting conversation. It's educational and it really gives you like a broader thought process and helps you kind of manage situations, but also helps you understand what you're feeling a little bit while saying, hey, you know what? I can believe in this and not necessarily do what a church is telling me to do yeah. all the time. And look, say you're not interested in religion at all. If you just want to go on someone's page and see Christians berate them. Yeah. Right here, baby. <laughs> right here, you know, baby. If you just want to see a bunch of Christians tell a guy how stupid he is. <laughs> dude, that'll... I, sometimes when I get bored at night, I just read our comment section. I'm like, man, these people hate me. <laughs> and it's always a good time. So, you know, if you're just yeah. looking for somebody getting berated publicly, that's... You there you know, go. That always it. works. So... Yeah. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you guys for tuning in and, uh, until next time, peace Cheers. out. Yeah. Two dimes and a token.